Welcome to another episode of the Top Saw Woodworker. I'm your host, Robert Accardo, and I'm standing here on the banks of the beautiful Top Saw Creek in southwest Mississippi. Today's episode is going to be about the restoration and tuning of a nice little dovetail saw that I picked up at auction recently. And so, why don't we step into the shop and we'll get started on that. Well, welcome to my shop. And here's the little saw. As I said, I won it in an auction not too long back. Uh, I was sitting pretty far back, had not had a had the opportunity to look at the saw before the auction. And it came up, and the auctioneer started the bidding at $15. It got no bids. It went down to $12.50, then down to $10, $7.50, $5, finally $3. And I said, you know, it's worth hanging on the wall for 3 bucks. So I held up my number. No other bidders bid against me, and I got the little saw. When I got a chance to look at it, I see that it's a Spear and Jackson, warranted Sheffield Castile. It's got an emblem of... Uh, like two acrobats, one jumping over the other one. Something else written on here, I can't really tell what it is. But it's a good hardwood handle. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably English Beach. Uh, there's a name stamped in the handle, Mr. A.H. Pedley, and he liked it so much he put his name in the handle. And he liked looking at it so much he put a little hang hole right here, if you, if you see. And, and where he put the hole was exactly where the saw would hang, straight up and down. So uh, let's go ahead and, and, and get started. And the first thing we're gonna do is to start disassembling. Hey, before I begin the disassembly, I thought I would illustrate the problem with the saw as I found it. The saw is actually not dull. Uh, it's not real sharp, but it's not dull. But it has little or no set to it at all. So that's about as deep as it can saw and it gets stuck. And it doesn't matter. And that's about it. So that's one of the things that we'll be doing is uh, giving the saw some set before we get through with it. Okay, let's start by taking the screws out of the handle. And I have not done this previously, so I'm not sure what kind of trouble I'm going to have or what tools I should have brought out, but they're all close at hand, so whatever I need, I'll just get it. Looks like I'm going to need something to help drive the, uh, the bolts out. It's probably been in there a day or two. I've just got a short piece of quarter inch dowel and a little plastic hammer. And that seems to do the trick nicely. Just don't want to break that beautiful little handle that it has. Make sure that I've got it in the right spot. Seems to be giving me some trouble. There it goes. Just want to be in the right spot. So we'll take the handle off. Now obviously we'll be cleaning up nice little brass back on this saw, by the way, a little folded brass back. Uh, the plate looks to be in pretty good shape. Uh, there's some, some rust, but most of it seems to be very, very surface. I think most of that's going to come out nicely. Now on the handle, uh, the the finish on it is pretty much dead. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and strip it down, uh, probably to the wood, and bring it back up with a new finish. Hey, there are a lot of ways to clean this saw plate. If you watch 10 different videos on YouTube, you'll probably see 10 different ways to do it. Uh, I'm going to just use some regular old paint thinner and some sandpaper, steel wool. I'll go up through grits of sandpaper until I can get it smooth and shiny, and I'm going to spare you watching me do a lot of sanding. I hate sanding uh, on videos, and I hate to do sanding, so I will come back when we've got the plate cleaned up. There was one thing that I did not mention that I do like to use on a saw plate, and that is uh, just a razor blade. Uh, if it's a big handsaw, I'll use a large razor blade. 
on the small one. I'll use just a smaller straight edge blade and it will uh, take off this scaly rust very quickly and uh, does a good job. Get my blade to stay open. And like I said, I won't bore you with watching these straight rust, but that's the way it's gonna go. Okay, and we're back and after quite a bit of elbow grease, Took a while, but uh, got it cleaned up. Uh, did I get every blemish out of it? No, still got a lot of staining in the metal, but the, the rust is gone, the brass is clean, the plate is straight, that's what matters to me. It's gonna be a good saw. Uh, it, you know, the only shelf this saw is ever gonna sit on is gonna be the one in this shop waiting for me to pick it up and do something with it. So I'm not trying to do a museum restoration here at all. I'm just trying to take this saw and make it back usable. So that's gonna be good enough until we get around to actually sharpening and setting the blade. Uh, so I think we'll turn our attention now to the handle. Uh, what I'm gonna do with the handle is probably try to use just lacquer thinner to take off the old lacquer and see if I can get down. I, I don't even wanna take all the patina off this old, uh, this old piece of wood. I think it's beautiful and I just wanna Take the finish off and try to uh, get a new, you know, a new finish on it. That probably, much like the the plate, I don't want to, as I say, wipe its memory. I want to let it have its memory, and I want to let it uh, be what it is, which is almost a hundred year old saw, probably, and uh, and go back to work. That's okay. Uh, what I'm going to do to strip the handle is just to try to use some. Uh, lacquer thinner. Uh, I don't care what brand, this is just what I buy locally, doesn't really matter. I'm just going to put it in a container and pour enough to cover it and I'll probably have to weight it down. I'm sure that wood's going to float. Yeah, I'll have to weight it down with something. And I'll just give that long enough until the, the finish begins to come off and I'll probably mostly scrape it. Uh, might do a little sanding, probably some steel wool, but mostly okay. scrape. It's been about 15, 20 minutes. Wasn't really watching. It's been a while. Let's see what we have. Got my old card scraper here. I want to see if that finish is going to start coming off. Well, it's getting a little aggressive, but... I don't know if you can see it on camera, but the answer is yes. The finish is beginning to come off. I'm going to take my time and, and just slowly take off the old lacquer. Matter of fact, a lot of it has come off just in the lacquer thinner bath that it was in. I'm gonna go over it and uh, take off as much of the old finish as I can get. Well, all of the old finish eventually. And it's just a, a matter of time. Hey, what's working the best at the moment seems to be just plain old 4 aught steel wool. <laughs> Taking most of that old finish off and I will use anything and everything from toothbrushes to old chisels, you know, just anything that I have to, to get in there and get that off. And I didn't want to bore y'all with the mundane details of this, just kind of going through the process more so than anything else. So, Okay, after quite a bit of detail work with uh, everything from my old dull pocket knife to card scraper, I even did a little detail work in these corners with the chisel uh, steel wool, just, I mean, anything, whatever you have to use. Uh, I think we got it. What I'll do now is just put it up to dry. As you saw, it was soaking in lacquer thinner. I need to let all of that evaporate out at least a day. Uh, and then I'll probably soak it, uh, for another day in linseed oil, boil linseed oil, let that go in and feed the wood, uh, let that dry up. And then, uh, We'll coat it with shellac and then some lacquer.
but for now that's as far as we go. Okay, as you can see the handle has had a chance to soak and well not soak but dry overnight. Uh, this is a good time to check for any uh, little bits of finish that might still be left. Uh, I don't see any, nothing that concerns me. So I think it's in pretty good shape. I have a container here. I'm going to uh, put down a couple of sticks just to keep it up off the bottom. And what I'm going to do is simply give it a good soak with some boiled linseed oil. Uh, some people use raw linseed oil. I haven't found an issue. Uh, they both work. Uh, do the same thing. Also, since we know the hammer, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, saw handle is going to float, I'm going to use this old copper hammer just to hold it down. Is it necessary to soak it? Well, probably not, but I have the luxury of having a gallon of linseed oil and a tote. So I'm going to do it this way. It's just as easy, goes quick. All right, so we'll let that sit there uh, for at least an hour or so, and then we will take it out and let it dry. Okay, it's been a couple of hours probably, and that's probably about twice as long as necessary. Uh, this old saw tote is very, very dry, or was very, very dry, and I'm sure that it has absorbed as much of the boiled linseed oil as it can by now. So I'm just gonna dry it off best I can and then I'm going to set it on these small sticks to finish drying and I'll just come by every once in a while and wipe it down again in case any oil sweats out as it will sometimes it's almost as if the wood becomes super saturated, takes in more than it can hold when it gets in the air. The little bits come back out and you have to dry that off because boiled linseed oil does dry to a very light film and you don't want little bubbles or fish eyes in it. So I just come by every so often and dry it up until there are no more and then I give it typically overnight to dry before we go to the next phase which is to put a coat of shellac to seal the oil in and uh, allow the lacquer finish to come over the top of that. Okay, just as a side note, uh, these rags, and anything, the newspaper, any shavings that get in, in the way, get any of that linseed oil on it, uh, especially the boiled linseed oil, that is one of the uh, oils that does have dryers in it and uh, I will typically take them and hang them outside and you can see we're having a little South Mississippi thunderstorm take place at the moment but I have some sawhorses outside and even a, an outside workbench that I use on pretty days uh, there's my shop assistant checking the weather but I, I just hang them outside to dry um, and then eventually throw them away Okay, while the saw tote is drying, and I'm still checking for any little bits of moisture coming out of uh, any of the screw holes or anywhere, while that's drying, I thought I would go ahead and get on sharpening the saw plate. And I don't need the handle for that, obviously. Uh, and normally, I would chuck a saw up into my Sergeant and Company number 90 saw vise, but there's a problem because this is a back saw. As it goes in, the jaws down in this area want to hit the back before it clamps the plate. So I will not be able to, uh, to use the traditional saw vise for this little saw. It's too small and with the back. So what I'll do is I'll just use what I was taught as a saw chalk. This is the way it was taught to me. Uh, by the old timer that showed me when I was a kid. He was a retired general contractor back in the day when when they built your house, they built everything from the ground up, including the windows and the, uh, uh, the cabinets, uh, possibly the doors. 
Uh, but before we use the saw chock, we need to start this process and to, by jointing the saw. And what I have here is a jointer. Uh, you don't have to have this. This is a just nothing more than a jig that holds a short piece of mill file or bastard file is the proper terminology for it. And let me remove this saw vise because it's just in the way now. And you'll simply put the joiner over the saw and just give it a few light passes. You're not trying to do a whole lot. You just want to give it one more. All you want to do is put a flat spot on the top of each tooth. Uh, that levels the teeth and then as you file, the flat, and when the flat spot goes away and becomes a point, you have a sharp tooth. So now having done that, I'm going to turn it around and put it in the saw chock. Let it stick up. One of the disadvantages to using the saw chock is that I'm a lot lower than the, the saw vise. And I don't like to lean over and work. The other option is to sit down, but I don't do that real well. So I have a pair of magnifying goggles because at my age, not easy to see the each individual tooth. So what I'll do is I'll get down here, try to find focus on this thing. It's not easy to do. And I'm going to be filing rip, which means I'm going to just be going straight across the saw. Uh, if it were a cross cut, there would be some, some uh, angle to the file and so forth, a flame and, and, and that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, this is the front of the saw plate. And I'm going to get in here. I'm going to drop that. I've got it sticking up a little bit much, which is causing some vibration, so I'm going to readjust. It's always going to vibrate. I know that, but uh, the top of my file is flat uh, and straight across uh, for at least the first inch. And I'm looking in the front of that first tooth has, has got a, a sharp top on it. Sixteen teeth, just like this, with the file flat across the top, and ninety degrees to the saw plate. Why sixteen teeth? Because that's going to be about the first inch, inch of this saw and it has 16 teeth per inch. Talking and not counting. Fifteen. 
and 16. Now, what I'm going to do from here on out, well, not from here on out, but for about the next inch, is I'm going to take this file where as it was flat across the top, I'm going to lean it slightly forward and do another inch. And the purpose of that is to uh, make the front of the saw not as aggressive. The teeth will be almost straight up and down. But as I get to the back of the saw, I will roll this file until the teeth are leaning forward and they will, it will be very aggressive towards the back of the saw. So here we go. Very important to give the each uh, gullet actually or each tooth uh, the same number of strokes so that you all of the teeth will end up at the same height. Now when I get through uh, what I'll do is I'll go back and actually check to see if I have any teeth that still have a flat spot or if I missed and I will touch those up individually uh, you don't have to it's not going to hurt anything if you have one or two teeth that are slightly higher well you don't want any of them higher but slightly lower Okay, from here on out, I'm going to really roll this saw over until now I want this edge of the file to be really vertical. Uh, and that's going to cause the teeth to have a real, real hard rake to them uh, facing forward. because that's probably about like watching sanding. I'm gonna turn the camera off and come back when I have finished the plate. Okay, I have finished sharpening. I'm just checking along here and I see a couple of them. Uh, you know, you can tell by the rust, they're not shiny like the other teeth. So I'm gonna just go ahead and uh, give them about a stroke each. Should just about take care of it. Now, I didn't talk about my file very much. Uh, on this small uh, back saw like this with, with uh, a high tooth count, uh, I like to use a, an extra slim. Uh, they do come in different sizes. You'll have some of these that'll be real wide. What you want to do is to select a file that uh, one face of the file is at least twice as high as the tooth is deep. That way you're always using half of a face to sharpen and you don't have a dull spot in the file and it will always file evenly. The file is eventually going to get dull but at least it will be even and it won't cut the tooth crooked. So all right uh, that's pretty much that or sharpening. Uh, that probably took me about five minutes. Uh, the saw chalk, again, nothing more than a piece of wood. Drill a hole in the end to stop the split, put it in the vise, and it clamps up. Uh, the next step will be to use a saw set. Uh, the saw set, this is an old Stanley, and it has, uh, you know, this part is called the anvil. There's a little plunger that comes out and pushes. That's called the hammer. And now what we're going to do is we're going to push every other tooth away from us and then turn it around and push the other 
every other tooth away, and that will give us some set in the saw blade. The teeth have to be wider than the plate. That's the problem that this saw had when I got it and probably still has. It, it has sharp teeth now, but I promise you it still has no set. If we try to saw into a, a, a board, you're gonna see the same thing happen. It's gonna get about that deep, you know, about a half inch deep and just stop. Uh, it'll, it'll cut like a maniac till it gets to that half inch, but then it's just gonna stop because the saw plate is gonna be binding. So what we need to do is to uh, use the saw set and spread the teeth. Now, most saw sets, the hammer is going to be, for a, for a saw this size, it's going to be too wide. Uh, one of the reasons I'm using this old Stanley is because I could actually take it apart and take the hammer out of it, and I got on it with a file, and I made it narrower because these teeth are so fine. If it was a great big uh, rip saw, it would be fine because the tooth would be wider than the hammer in there. But uh, I have this one, I've, I've worked on it and made it a little bit narrower for these small saws. So let me get set up on that. We'll be right back.